Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, listeners. Thanks so much for joining us again this week. With me is Vicki Drown. I did get that right, didn't I? No, it's Valerie. 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 <laughs> and I was just talking about how I wasn't going to screw up her last name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Right. Oh, I'm I'm a winner on bl- on bludgeoning names every single week. Just about. Anyway, Valerie is a she's a two time caregiver, both for a parent and a child. So she's kind of a uh, sandwich generation caregiver, like with a little extra twist. But I'm going to let Valerie, not Vicky, introduce herself. We're also here to talk about. Um, caring for the caregiver. She is in New York, upstate New York, she said, Adirondack Mountains. And um, New York's got a special program we're going to talk about. And we're also going to discuss how you can find local resources and maybe encourage your state like mine of California to adopt a program like they've got in New York. Okay, Valerie, (laughs) after butchering your name, thanks for joining me. (laughs) It's all good. So yes, I am a caregiver of a child with special needs and a mother with Alzheimer's disease. Um, My grandmother died when I was 13 and she died of Alzheimer's disease back in the 80s when we knew very little and there were no services out there. And I watched my grandfather just give his all and she died at home, which is what he wanted for her. Uh, but I watched the struggles of that. And then um, it kind of, I think, set my mission for how I was going to proceed in life. Granted, I still probably wanted to be everything, but I eventually settled on the fact that I'm I'm built to work with people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, my uncle, who was like a father to me, he died in 2020 at the start of um, COVID. And he died of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, because what we know is we can get more than one dementia which is wonderful. Um, But we were very blessed to be able to be with him during his passing because we got just before COVID when everything shut down and we wouldn't have been able to spend our time with him. So um, we felt that that was a true blessing. And then my mother now with Alzheimer's disease. So um, we we definitely, or I have definitely um, been stretched in, understand what it's like to be a caregiver But I also see that as such a positive for when I'm talking with somebody, because it's not just me saying, oh, I can imagine how bad that feels. It's like, "Mm, it feels awful. And I have felt everything you're feeling. And if you need someone to call, you want to yell, you want to be frustrated, you want to swear or whatever you want to do. I'm here and I'll get it. So I I see that as being a real positive, even in all the horribleness of it. (laughs) I agree. And I don't know if you remember if we even talked about it before. So my, my mom also died at the start of the pandemic, mm-hmm. actually March 31st, 2020. Mm-hmm. My maternal grandmother probably had mixed dementia starting with vascular. Mm-hmm. And my maternal great grandmother also had dementia. She died before I was born. So um, I only have stories of like her filling a Tupperware bowl full of water and putting it on the stove, which is got to be atrocious smelling. <laughs> Yeah, but I didn't live through that. So, and my grandmother wasn't um, physically close, so that's also adds to the stress of um, caregiving. And I don't know, my my mom is the oldest of four. The other sister is eleven years younger. So my mom or my grandmother was probably still dealing with kids at home while she was trying to deal with her mom. So yeah, yeah. <sighs> and see, and it's it's the hard part is especially being in that sandwich generation you're kind of dealing with the the guilt of who am I paying more attention to and how far can I stretch myself thin? And I'm still trying to work a job and I still have a husband and I, I have all of these responsibilities, but I still have a son and I still have a mother and, and each one has their own needs and each one is exhausting and you don't want to fail either side. So it's, it's definitely um it's definitely tough yeah so um i did not list your background and your 
your profession. So I'll have you tell the audience that because it's, it's important. <laughs> so um, I actually, my degree is I'm a licensed mental health counselor in the state of New York. And um, I am the director of the Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative and the caregiver wellness and respite center. So they are two programs. The Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative helps all caregivers of people with dementia, any type of dementia. There doesn't need to be a diagnosis. All they need to say is, hey, we have some memory loss. On the other side, I have the Caregiver Wellness and Respite Center, which is to help caregivers of everything else. So basically, I can help caregivers across across the lifespan. Just those two. No small fees. Res- as a, just those two responsibilities is a lot. And then you add your mom and your son, and it's like, <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> mm-hmm. And some gray hair. And yeah, yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Well, your gray hair looks awesome. So oh, thanks. <laughs> I keep telling my hair gal, my maternal grandmother had beautiful, like white shimmery hair. Mm -hmm. Um, You might be old enough to remember when they did the spun glass for like Christmas snow. That's what my grandmother's hair looked like. So I'm like, let me know when mine's getting close to that. And then we'll just, you know, we won't worry, (laughs) you know, um, I don't have to do being a blonde. I don't have to do too much, thankfully. So yeah. <laughs> just the occasional, can we lighten it back up? It's starting to look like I live in a closet. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it feels that way. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's, you know, April and it's still cold. So I'm ready for warm weather. So why don't we start with some professional slash well-lived experience type tips on how caregivers can go from feeling like they want to run screaming into the street in front of the next bus to feeling a little bit more relaxed and maybe a little less frantic. I think for most caregivers, we try it on our own for a while. Um, We run at 150%. Um, And one of the things to remember is that 884 million hours are being given by unpaid caregivers. So family members, we're putting in all of this time and we're saving $16 billion and yet we're running ourselves ragged and we're doing it mostly, at least in the beginning alone. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the biggest things I can tell people is to start with thinking about a support squad. We call it our support squad. Um, Who do you have? And I'm not talking about someone who has to be right on your six all the time. I'm talking about maybe someone who can come and cut your grass for you because you just can't take the time. What about that person who maybe would call you before they go grocery shopping and say, hey, listen, do you need anything? Because I'm willing to pick you up some stuff. Um, So decide who those people are. And then you decide the people that you are able to talk with. And sometimes it's not always other family members. And I know that's who we always tend to go to as we say, oh, I've got my sister. And I do have my sister. I have a sister. So I can sit and I can talk to her about anything. But, you know, sometimes what I need to talk about is not something I want to maybe disclose to a family member. So I need that person that I can be the real me and say exactly what I feel, the good, the bad, the ugly, the totally ugly. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that is a counselor. Maybe that is, um, someone like me who sits at an agency and says, Hey, listen, I totally get it. And you can call me, take advantage of that. Call them, talk to your primary care doctor, be honest with them and say, this is how I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. It stinks. And I just don't know. I'm not being able to fall asleep recently. That seems to be my trouble lately is I can't fall asleep. So, you know, having those conversations, but definitely realizing that although your situation is unique and I will never take that away from anybody, every situation is unique. There still are things that we can connect with other people on. And so Mm -hmm. doing it alone, putting my cape on every day and trying to be, you know, Wonder Woman it's great in theory, but it eventually in practice, it's going to break me down. Mm-hmm. And so 
creating that support squad and early in the ball game, don't wait until there's a crisis. Don't wait until, you know, you're at end stage trying to get it. The support squad created early in the ball game is definitely being proactive. And to me, what's going to be the most helpful so that when you need them, it's ready. And you're not trying to do things in a panic. Oh, I hate panic. Yeah, we don't make very good decisions when we're running around like our hair's on fire. <laughs> Even if no. it's something simple or something as complex as what you're talking about. So I have a, a, maybe it's like an elevator speech on how to put together. I like, I called it a care team. I like care squad, so, or mm -hmm. support squad. I like support both. Squad. Yep. Um, is when you get a diagnosis or when you realize that something is really not going right, to make a list of everybody you know, local, not local, family, not family, doesn't matter. And then make a, a list of all of the chores you have to do today. And then all the chores you have to do this week. And then the random things that pop up every month, like doctor's appointments or whatever, mm -hmm. those, those things that always throw our, the rest of our schedules off. Mm -hmm. And then look at the two lists and see who on the list of people you know could maybe take over some of the things on the to-do list, you know, mm -hmm. the the needs list and yeah. find which one, like the person who's the most capable of doing certain things. Like, you know, you could have somebody from out of state, you know, Valerie and I are completely across the country from each other. And she's not going to ask me to do this because regular listeners know if you ask me to do things like call insurance companies, I would probably say, okay, but the thought of it stresses me out. I hate it. Don't want to deal with it. I, my patience for dealing with the bureaucracy of that is pathetically low. Mm -hmm. It is just how I, you know, I try to psych myself up. I'm an adult. I can take care of my own phone calls. Da -da -da -da. Nope. Hate it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just like, cannot do it, but you need food, grocery run, um, you know, whatever I you know, come sit with your person for an hour, have tea with you. Um, Valerie's also a coffee drinker, so, you know, I could do all that without, without batting an eye. And it also, you're asking somebody to participate in a way that is mm -hmm. comfortable and not overwhelming. Cause I think a lot of people, they hesitate to jump in to help because they're like, they have their 500 responsibilities to manage. And even if they're not caring for a child or a parent that's got special needs, you know, they're like, oh, I don't, you know, they don't want to get sucked in. And this is a really simple way is like, hey, you know, Valerie, can you like set up the online payments and get that all straightened out? I, I've made a mess of it because I hate doing that stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I actually learned that from a previous podcaster um, there. He was on with his mom, their family ended up taking care of his grandmother and then his grandmother's sister who had never married or had kids. And they actually they had the care committee. They like, they actually wanted to make it like a legal entity. Sure. And that's exactly how now they d divvied up the tasks amongst family members. Not all of us are blessed to have, you know, super functioning families. Sure. <laughs> and, you know, there's no reason why you can't incorporate your neighbors, you know, people right. in the community, whatever. So, yeah. And I think that, for, I think for people who are listening to this podcast, it's important that if you're listening to this, and you are on a support squad. So you're maybe not the caregiver, but you're thinking of people as we're talking that you're on their support squad or could be on their support squad. One of the things that I would tell you is that saying to a caregiver, hey, listen, give me a call if you need something, typically is not the best way of providing support because number one, we, we're typically very independent to, it, to our own demise. Um, number two is when we're in the dregs of it, we are just so overwhelmed that even a phone call to ask for something, we often don't even know what we need to ask for, but we know we're not typically going to be making that phone call that says, hey, um, I really could use some milk. So my thought is, is if you're on a support squad or maybe you're, you haven't thought about that yet is, say, you know, so my talent is, I really think that I'm a good baker. I like to do old fashioned baking. So I like to bake donuts, Oh, fun. So, homemade donuts. So if I want to bake donuts and so then I'm going to call someone and say, Hey, listen, I have some donuts for you. I know you're really busy. I'm going to leave them out on your porch. And, and I was just thinking of you and I hope this helps maybe. 
Um, so it's doing some of the little things or maybe picking up a gift card and say, hey, I was thinking about you. I thought you could use maybe some gas. Here you go. So it's just those little tiny things that say, I'm thinking of you. I care about you. I'm willing to be on your support squad, but it's not requiring me to reach out and do something. This is where my two lists help. So you've got your list of people and your list of responsibilities. And, you know, if so-and-so comes up to you and is like, oh my gosh, Valerie, I didn't realize you were taking care of your son and your mother. Like, uh -huh. Is there anything I can do to help? Bam, you have an answer other sure. than, oh no, that, thank you very, I'll, I'll let thank you know. You yeah. yeah. No, you can say, oh my gosh, I know you, you know, you manage the bank. So maybe you could help set up the online banking or, um, I hear you make great homemade donuts. I could really use those. You know? I'll send them to California. Sure. <laughs> I like to bake too, but unfortunately I'm the only one that likes to eat sweets. So I have to, I usually have to bake stuff and then share it with the neighbors. That's all right there. You're part of their support squad. Yep. And then fortunately, nobody's in dealing immediately with caregiving. Mm. My, my caregiving these days, since my mom is gone, is I have a nine and a half year old golden retriever who is uber social and needs to go on her social walk in the morning, which my husband mm. does. And then she would very much prefer to go to the <clears throat> dog park as many afternoons as I can tolerate. <laughs> and and my, my caregiving on my son is dealing with a 17 year old who has autism and is extremely volatile mental health wise, mm -hmm. um, numerous hospital visits and actually attempted to kill me in 2018. Oh, fun. So when I say I'm a caregiver on both sides, I am a caregiver on both sides. So it is, um, it's challenging, but I want to stress to people who are listening is that there's help out there. I mean, I know I'm in New York. I know I'm in upstate New York in the Adirondack Mountains, by the way, for those of you who don't know, beautiful area of New York, um, poorly resourced. So New York State came up with this um, great grant program where it was $7.5 million to help for us, it's six counties. So we help Clinton, Franklin, Essex, Warren, Washington, and Hamilton counties in New York. So very upstate. And we get, we're given the 7.5 million to provide services because if we could keep good care of the caregivers, we could delay nursing home placement. And isn't mm -hmm. that what most of us are trying to do is delay that nursing home placement. And so we provide caregiver assessment. So basically care management. We have education and support groups. We offer caregiver wellness programs. So if somebody says, you know, I'd really like to do yoga, but you know, I don't know. We have a yoga class for caregivers specifically, and we pay for everything. Nice. All you have to do is show up or for the yoga class, it's online. So you don't even have to leave. Uh, we have memory cafes and we offer respite, which um, is another huge thing that caregivers need is just to get a break. And some, some of the caregivers that I talk to, they're like, oh, well, I could go run and I could go get my groceries and I could go to the pharmacy and I could go to the, you know, and I said, or you could go sit at a park with a book. I don't want caregivers to think that when you get a break, that means you just have to run it as crazy as you can to get everything done. It's okay to breathe. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Yeah, you can and go to think sit of at, ourselves. Sit at the dog park and try to keep a golden retriever out of the pond. Totally. Totally. <laughs> and you get your exercise. So see a little well, zen, a little exercise. Yeah, we have um so it's it's a private community dog park in between in the winter from 3 30 to 4 30 and then most of the year from four to five is what i call yappy hour because that's when most of us are there. Really wish <laughs> they'd move that to like 4 30 to 5 30 be a little bit better. Um and so they just run around, play with each other. My dog, like I said, she's super social. So she goes and collects the uh, must love me tax from each person. Um, occasionally she'll jump in the lake and then expect somebody to pet her and love on her, which Aww. generally they don't want to do. Yeah. So it's, it's, there's days when it's like, I know she needs it, but you know what? It's going to benefit me as well. Cause I'm going to get out of the house. I'm going to actually talk to a human face to face, not on Zoom. <laughs> It's amazing how, and even the quiet days when it's just like me and the dog and maybe some of the smaller dogs that just kind of stand around and 
and breathe in the fresh air. I don't know what they're doing there. <laughs> you know, then I have to engage with the dog and it's, it's, a, it's very relaxing, especially if you don't, you know, don't plug any headphones in, just, you know, just play with the dog, throw a stick in the lake, let her get that's it. What's important is we're not all cookie cutter. If we were Mm-mm. all cookie cutter, then man, it would be easy to say, Oh yeah, go to the dog park. That wouldn't be my quiet place, you know, cause I'd be nervous. Whereas my, my thing might be going to the park and just sitting in my car with the windows down and reading a book. Cause I can't get quiet time sometimes. So, um, I think that that's what's important. And that's, what's great about our caregiver wellness program is we can do activities based around caregivers interests and build a supportive network where it's not like a support group where you have to go and talk about all your life's problems. This is where you can go and just be, and it's okay. It's okay. So what it's kind fun. of pro it sounds fun. What kind mm-hmm. of programs do you have in the wellness program? So we have pickleball, we have Tai Chi, we have book club, we have crafternoons, um, we have uh, lunch bunches. So just getting together over a meal. Um, let me see here. There's a, we have a whole bunch. We go and do hiking, painting. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's very all over. We have a uh, pottery. They can go to see um, school plays. We'll pay for the admission to go and see plays together. So it's really, um, it, it, we try to reach as many interests as we can, realizing we aren't all cookie cutter. So um, do you have I ones that, that are more specific for men? Because you mentioned hiking. Men love the lunch, lunch bunch. I was saying the lunch bunch would probably be good. And pickleball. Oh, pickleball. yeah, pickleball. Yeah. And Tai Chi. So there are, um, there are definitely groups that men can join. We find that typically there are more women that join our wellness events than there are men. But And the well, hiking events are popular. Yeah. I was thinking, because it's like a lot of times I hear complaints that there's that a lot of support services and a lot of things are kind of geared toward women. It's like, well, two thirds of us are the caregivers. So, right. you know, <laughs> suck it right. up guys. Right. Um, but it's still important. That was why I was asking, like, um, I live in a community. Well, we have pickleball. Um, you can go fishing if you want. That would bore me to tears. Um, I don't even want to watch them go fishing. <laughs> I would. I'd go fishing with them. Totally okay. Would. Well, they can fish in the dog park pond. They just can't do it <laughs> from the inside of the dog park. Mm-hmm. Um, I have mixed emotions on that one just because my dog can swim. She would swim across the lake if there was an incentive. It's not that big, but it's yeah. not small. So, yeah. you know, so yeah. you could uh, you could take dogs to the dog park and let them loose and somebody else can watch them. And then you could go fish with the kids or the whoever's out there in the afternoon. <laughs> I think what's nice about the caregiver wellness program is um, as a caregiver, you you feel like you lose your identity. And Mm -hmm. um, for me, I felt like I was trapped in my own home. I called myself a prisoner in my own home. Um, And so having the opportunity to be able to get out and and enjoy that space, but also be around with others who understand that. And I'll tell you, get on the pickleball court. That is not an easy sport. An easy sport. It's very competitive. Um, but to me, it allows it allows me it allows caregivers to really not feel like that prisoner, which creates some resentment as well. And nobody wants that. Yeah, it's just not healthy. Like no. you were saying before we hit record, we you we were talking about my my grocery delivery debacle this week, and you you were claim claiming saying that you enjoy going to the grocery store because you like to watch other people's meltdowns. <laughs> I like the routine. I'd like to say that I said I like the routine. That's true. Yeah. She didn't say that. I can first. watch other people's meltdowns and not my own. <laughs> and yeah. you know, and I don't object to going to the grocery store, but. I still, there's days when it's like, why are there things out of stock? This is like 2024, not 2020. That just annoys the, 
whiz out of me. It's like, okay, this is annoying. If I got to deal with this crap, I'm just going to deal with delivery. And all of the uh, ins and outs that I've learned about delivery <laughs> is wild. But then I can yeah. do other things like go to the dog park. Yeah. So, or go yeah. on a bike ride. I'm part of the Sierra Foothill Cycling Club, which, you know, once we get some nicer weather, and I know this is coming out, it'll be nice weather when this hits the airwaves, so to speak. But it's like, They've had to cancel like the last three rides because it's been raining. It's like, could yeah. you stop raining on Saturday, please? I, I know. Well, in our caregiver wellness events, it's great because they're scattered at different times. So some might be on the weekend, some might be in the evenings, in the morning. So we're trying to hit caregivers at all different times because, again, not cookie cutter. We have to make sure that we're trying to meet the needs of people and of caregivers and provide them with that outlet when it's good for them. It, it's we're trying we are definitely trying well sounds like you guys are doing a great job i hope so and we're we're hoping that this conversation might help spark something with somebody else because you guys are the only state doing this we are <sighs> we are new york has been really uh at the forefront of pushing services for caregivers of people with dementia and so kudos for what our caregivers have available to them and hoping that other states will come along and see the value of the money that they can save. And I, you know, you have to put it in financial terms sometimes, but the money that they can save while also showing the quality of life that we can improve by taking care of the caregiver. Um, so I would say that with the services that we offer through our program, although that they might not be in one pretty package in your state, whoever is listening in your state, but maybe um, attending memory cafes, type in the word memory cafes, memory cafes in your area or contact your local office of the aging and ask what's available for those things. Um, support groups, Alzheimer's Association is a national wide organization, right? Yep, I'm a facilitator of an online support group. Yep. So you have the support groups in your in your area, and they have an education and training program. Um, but there may I be also other, do that too. <laughs> there you go. And there might be other organizations within your community. But reach out to your office of the aging. Um, go to AARP website. Start really looking for thinking of yourself as the caregiver about what is important for taking care of you. That's what I tell caregivers. You are important because if you break down, the system breaks down. So yep. taking care of yourself, although it seems so selfish to a caregiver, it is absolutely required and necessary. So reaching out and finding out, is Project Lifesaver available in your area? We have it through our grant for free, but finding out if Project Lifesaver is an option in the county that you're in because it's an important program for wanderers. Um, and the other one we do is music and memory. Mm, we do a music fun. and memory program. So that's for people who maybe are caring for someone who is agitated. Music and memory program can really help because you're putting earphones on and you're putting the music specific to what they used to love. Um, so for my mom, it would be religious music. I would be putting on all the old hymns and I'm telling you she will go to another world and any agitation or or nervousness that she has will go away. Mm. Yeah. My so mom was a talk people. radio listener, so I should have played my mom podcasts. There you go. There you go. Maybe that's why you do what you do. <laughs> Could be. Did I did hear a lot of talk radio as a kid. Um, can you explain memory cafes? I actually have not had a lot of conversations about memory cafes which is like hello i've done over 350 episodes oh you I need did... to have i mean i can tell you about memory cafes but so this is where a caregiver and a care receiver go to an activity together because what we know is that it memories fade right and so we need to maybe build new memories so that we have something more current that we can pull from so we have events that take place where we have a guy who comes and he sings like Elvis. <laughs> and so we have caregivers and care receivers who come to this event together. There's food, 
there's entertainment, and they're able to sit and enjoy the moment together. And it's wonderful. You see husbands and wives getting up to dance together, slow dance. You see, you know, moms and daughters dancing to, you know, whatever song they're playing. You have um, painting activities. One little lady, she didn't want to paint uh, pumpkins. (laughs) And she kept kind of going back and forth. And she finally sat down and ended up loving the activity of painting pumpkins. And the daughter came afterward and she's like, thank you so much. She goes, it meant the world to me. We haven't done anything like this together. So it's finding the time to spend together and create the new memories so that you have those moments because sometimes those moments are very few and far between. Yeah, I did something like that. There was, um, in my old hometown, there was a uh, church-run daycare that was strongly encouraged to add elder care to their services, and they did. And I took my mom... She must have been early days of memory care. I took her just to kind of check it out. Mm -hmm. Um, And my mom was super reluctant to do a lot of things. But when there was other people in the room besides me, she was more interested. Like we played cornhole, um, which she did pretty good at considering. And we painted rocks, which she probably wouldn't have appreciated, you know, as an adult with a fully functioning brain. Mm -hmm. Um, I enjoyed it just because it was relaxing. I like creative stuff. So that's my Zen. Um, and she talked to other people that were like her, but at first she was very reluctant, almost fearful. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I could have left her there. It would have taken, if, if her attending their program was my goal, it would have taken, you know, some easing into it. And that's how I would have started it. So it's, you know, I remember that day fairly well. It was a Valentine's event that they were introducing their services to the community, which unfortunately are, was about two years before COVID. So I don't know if that one's still around or not. <laughs> one of the things that I say to people when I train them is, you know, think about when you go to a, a dinner and it's maybe a, a dinner out in the community and there's a number of people who are going to attend and you walk in and they say, have a seat anywhere you watch a different look come across people's faces because all of a sudden we have to evaluate where we're going to sit and who's going to be sitting by who. And I, I, I much rather prefer when someone says, oh, Valerie, here's your seat right here. Okay. For a person with dementia, going into a new situation where things are unfamiliar and nothing is quite making sense, and even though it's being explained to you, it still doesn't quite make sense because as processing those 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 neuron firings aren't really happening like they should. It, it has to feel overwhelming. And yet when they get in front of others, it's those social skills that they've built inside their brain that are deep inside their brain that they've kept the longest. And you find that they do a lot better than what we would have given them credit for. And partially it is, they're people pleasing. They're going to be social. They're going to please others where they wouldn't do it for us. No kidding. (laughs) But they're going to do it. And um, I I think if you can encourage your your loved one to try something different and maybe just work it in there, I think memory cafes are a huge benefit for making those memories. I agree. Uh, Um, There was something I was going to say and I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, well. Um, oh yes, the um, just being with other people, other caregivers, and other people with, a, you know, some sort of dementia causing disease. Like yeah. my mom thrived at memory care because she had friends just like her. You know, they were they weren't getting frustrated. Although one funny story, my mom had a repetitive story about having dogs all her life, and when she was pregnant with me, my paternal grandmother suggested that she get rid of these dogs. Apparently, that continued to piss her off for 50 plus years <laughs> because that was her repetitive story yep. and she had befriended a gal in memory care and one day she started it on the story and the gal says oh, you've told me that story 803 times oh i was like three. Mm-hmm. i was like 803 wow that's a specific number and my mom looked at her kind of shocked like i have um but there was no like if i had said something like that she would have been offended oh totally 
Um, and then yeah. funny enough, about six weeks later, the same friend actually could start repeating the story. And I'm sitting there visiting with the two of them and I'm like in shock and horror and many emotions because I'm thinking, uh, is this elder abuse? Because this poor lady's heard this story enough times and she's remembering. <laughs> it was, yeah, I don't know how many times between 803 and that day, but I, yeah, yeah. But it was yeah. just like, you know, they got into mischief. They did things. They never mm -hmm. did anything, you know, harmful or bad. They would move things from one room to another because they were trying to hide it from somebody. It was like, I don't know. I never did quite get the motivations of some of the things they did, yeah. but yeah. she was accepted. Yeah. You know, no, nobody got frustrated with her about right. whatever. And yep. um, I had a, 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 an episode that came out in April on traveling with, you know, so dementia supported travel mm -hmm. and basically just being around people like caregivers yeah. that understand that the reason you're late for breakfast is because the poop probably hit the fan today. Right. Or you needed some extra sleep. Like they get it. Right. There's no, there's no judgment, you know, um, the yeah. care recipients befriend each other and support each other. So it's like, there's just a lot of benefits to basically socializing with caregivers and care recipients like yourself. And one of the other things, and you sparked something that I, I want to bring up too, is, is in working with caregivers. So I've been doing this for 21 years. And, and so working with caregivers, what I have found is one of the most difficult things is when their loved one forgets their name. Um, we attach a name and such, such significance to that name. And so my mother no longer remembers my name. In fact, my mother talks trash about Valerie and <laughs> says, you should meet my daughter and talks trash about her. And I'm like, oh, mom, she sounds horrible. And she's like, she is <laughs> I'm like, okay. oh, no. And then I, I make it my mission that although my mother doesn't know who I am or my name, my job is to be that smiling face, that person that's consistent. And I make it my goal to make her laugh. I figure out some way. And in fact, last week, we had a real bad visit yesterday, but the week before we had an awesome visit and I made her laugh so many times. And then she finally was laughing and she looked at me and she says, you're overwhelming, which was, <laughs> it was number one, hysterical. Number two, she got the word overwhelming out, um, which made me laugh. And so I try to remember that although my communication might not be able to be the same, um, I'm still going to do my best to be that face, that, that person who can make her laugh. And in that way, I'm creating the new memories that I can hang on to someday. And so the same goes with like memory cafe, creating those new memories that make it so that you have something good to think about the positive versus all of the, hmm. the horribleness of caregiving sometimes. And my mom thought I was her best friend. Yeah, yeah. And she would tell the staff or mm -hmm. other people, she, I, she's my best friend. I've known her forever, which of course oh, would make people chuckle because yeah. like, yeah, yeah, I think out of the population, you've known me the longest. You have bestie, <laughs> you know? And it's like, I kind of, I just attribute it like, well, it's kind of an upgrade, right? Um, I had mm -hmm. lost a ton of weight. So because I didn't hardly recognize my own self in the mirror, I'm like, there's no way my mother is putting this face and the past. Nope. I knew, I knew before I confirmed it, that she probably didn't connect this new person to the old person. So sure. it wasn't difficult or painful, um, which was, I guess, a blessing, but I always took her out. We'd go to the park to watch kids or the pool or whatever. We were always stalking children to watch. <laughs> and, <laughs> Um, we, my husband and I had gone to Colorado for a uh, conference and anybody, and I don't know why the hell they put Denver's airport where they did, but we were late getting home and we got home the wee hours of the morning. I am a very routine, go to bed at 10, get up at seven kind of person. Mm -hmm. When you mess up that routine, I was just like, Ugh. so I knew I was tired. I was going to visit my mom and I'm like, I'm just going to be smart not going to take her out because that was enough challenge to deal with her to get her from point a to point b um it happened to be my wedding anniversary so i brought my wedding album for her to look at because i knew she'd enjoy that but when i showed up she's like oh hi where are we going today and i was like oh it figures like the one time you remember me for that <laughs> but she oh. enjoyed i brought um chocolate spice cake that i made and some you know iced tea so my anniversary's in september 
and she looked at the wedding album. It didn't matter if she didn't recognize anybody and they're not herself or my dad or anybody. Um, she shared it with um, the gal that was the caregiver who was predominantly responsible for like my mom's showering and stuff. And she's had a really good time, you know, and yeah. I never let, um, I don't think I ever really acknowledged that she didn't remember my name, but I didn't really worry about it. It was like, eh, right. best friend is, could be worse. I get mother. I get yeah. mother, which to me is worse. <laughs> yeah. Well, my mom this never my talked mom. trash. I'm like, well, it's because they don't remember how old they are. And so you probably yeah. look like her mom in her memory. Yes. But still, that's, I know. If, yeah. if my mom had referred to me as my grandmother, which physically we looked a lot alike, um, it still would have, you know, occasionally I see that face in the mirror. It's like, ah, you know? yeah. it's like bad enough to see your mom in the mirror, but you see your grandmother. It's like, oh crap. Yeah. <laughs> Better run to the drugstore or the dermatologist or something. <laughs> um, I just don't correct her. I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. I'll be your mom today. Yeah. You at know? least my mom never talked smack about me to my face. I know. Right. That's a little much. I, I went home that night and I remember looking at my husband and I go, I don't think she liked me. <laughs> He's that's like Val. Funny. I'm like, no, things she liked me. <laughs> that's gotta be really well, tough. Yeah, it's just a handful. Ah, uh, my favorite story is my my mom had literally like two and a half closets of clothes. It was it would be overwhelming for an average person, and she had lost weight, and so a lot of the stuff that she had was like 20, 30 years old, didn't fit, was falling off for, and I don't know. My dad convinced me that I needed to like thin out her closet, so I did, and I kept asking her, you know. Do you want to keep this shirt? And everything was a good knock around the house shirt. And I'm like, mother, you have t seven blue knock around the house shirts plus the other colors. <laughs> well, my, she finally, I guess, got fed up with me or whatever and went in the other room and I finished it behind her back. And then I had to hide all the hangers so that she didn't realize they were gone. Right. Oh my God, was she mad at my sister <laughs> for taking her Aww. clothes? <laughs> uh, oh, darn. And my sister and I are estranged. So it was like, yay. Oh. Oh. I I won this one today. <laughs> it's like, you know, like you're like, wow, dementia for the win on this one because I'm not getting yeah. blamed. <laughs> I don't get many dementias for the win, but that's all right. I, I don't still... get too many either. I, that's why I were, the ones that I did get are very vivid. Yeah. I just figure my job is to make her laugh. I try really hard. My, yep. my, my goal with my mom was to give her the best quality of life and the most joy without dragging out dying from Alzheimer's. Yep. You know, cause I know some caregivers take such good care of their person like my mom. So my mom died at 77. So she was, she had no other ailments or she didn't have any walking issues. Everything sure. about her was fine except for her brain. Yep. And I didn't want to prolong. I mean, she had Alzheimer's for at least 20 years. Yeah. We didn't need to, we didn't need to extend that. That was right. enough journey. Right. No, I and understand. Then, she helped out by while well, she kind of got crossways with the caregiver um she was the more help she needed the less she accepted yeah. and they were showering her and she got angry with them and she they claimed that she reached for her clothes i'm like no 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 i know my mother <laughs> she like jerked away from me and she fell and broke her leg on march 8th 2020 and that was enough for her body and she passed away march 31st yeah. and so yeah. we did we were prevented from seeing her for two weeks, but mm -hmm. they did have us come in when they realized, oh crap, this lady's not going to make it. Yeah. Um, and then the day she died, there's actually 10 of us outside her room and the poor executive director was having a little bit of a stroke because <laughs> that was yeah. a little more than I think he was expecting when they said, uh, come now. Sure. So sure. we were blessed that way. We didn't have to deal with mom through the COVID nightmare. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we didn't, get the phone call that says, Oh, sorry, mom died. Call you when we can let you back in that. I cannot imagine that. So yeah. it was hard enough, but man, it could have been so much worse. So before we go off on 500 storytelling, <laughs> um, what is your last bit of advice for how those of us that I'm like, I'm a little disappointed in our governor. His father died from Alzheimer's right before his first inauguration. So you think California would be checking up on what you guys are doing, but managing the state I, is i is believe difficult. i heard that california was oh well our economy goes it. up down up down like a pendulum okay and then you know between the writer's strike and the actor's strike and everything that really 
took a hatchet to the state budget. We either have lots of money or no money. It's like mm -hmm. boom, bust, boom, bust. That's our, that's our state economy. Love it or leave it. Um, but you think that it would be prioritized because you're helping save money and improve lives. Like that should be a bipartisan goal. But since right now it's not yet, although I have state advocacy day coming up in about two and a half weeks. Okay. Um, I don't know what the topics are yet, but maybe I can sneak in some of this. Hey, did you know about this mm -hmm. program New York's doing? Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you guys should t yeah. check into it. <laughs> and I think, it's, I, I think it's finding those organizations within your area who have more of a government buy-in. Because, I mean, you're right. The average Joe Blow, Valerie Drown from Morrisonville, New York, is not going to be, you know, heard at the governor's level. But Valerie knows the people who are. And so it's trying to get a footprint into those organizations. And your offices of the aging have a pretty good footprint. So start advocating for what is needed in the area. When people say write letters, how many of you say, oh, I should write a letter, but don't. And when I say write a letter, I'm saying present the down and dirty, present the troubles you're having. You don't have to make it fancy and official. Be real, because those are the stories that really make a difference. But get connected to those agencies. The association, it's a great, the Alzheimer's Association, it's a national organization. They have a lot of pull. Start getting involved. Start voicing opinions. Start attending rallies. Do those type of things in order to get um, the needs met. Because New York really is at the forefront. Reference New York when you're talking to people. Say, you know, they have an Alzheimer's disease caregiver support program. 8.25 million is going to one of the agencies to help care of money. And it is a lot of money. And really when you're talking about six counties, it isn't not no. for all the services that you want to be able to provide to people, including respite. So 8.25 million is amazing. It's a drop in the bucket. And so what we need to continue to advocate for is not only services within New York, which I will always advocate for, because this is where I live, um, but more funding. It's not like dementia is going away. No. Nope. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And at some point we need to recognize the importance of taking care of our caregivers and the people with dementia. And so advocating for services in other states, and it's important for me to advocate for that as well. So if there's a way that I can advocate for other states to have services, it's all about the caregivers. I don't care what state you're in. I know what it's like to be a caregiver. And so if I can advocate, then I will. Well, and it's not like caregiving is a red or a blue mm -hmm. issue. It's a purple issue, which is why the Alzheimer's is. Association claims that they're purple. It is. At least purple is a good color. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, you got to be careful when you volunteer, though, because I'm really trying hard to retire from professional volunteering. <laughs> And so I, I, so I um, started out attending a support group. Now I'm a support group facilitator. I'm a legislative advocate and I just took on community education. Um, but now, because I'm working on expanding my, what I'm doing into professional speaking, now it's like you've sparked a thought about, I don't know that they'd pay, but I don't mind going and talking to local governments, county governments, state governments, whomever, and basically say, do you guys realize this is already messing up the economy? And it like at some point, this snowball is going to get to the point where we have people taking care of people who can't work and those people take doing the caregiving can't like we're going to be in a world of hurt if we don't right. figure out how to how to do better on elder care, but caregiving from childhood to right. death, whatever. Like, obviously, you have caregiving that's not elder care and, mm -hmm. you know, but COVID. there's a labor shortage across all of the nation. So mm -hmm. why not figure out a way that we can reduce the need for labor by keeping people at home, but it requires taking care of the caregiver. So we can save states money, but we've got to, we've got to get some backing. Yep. Well, Most corporations definitely. need to step up too. And that's my signature talk is how this is already affecting corporations, bottom lines. And here's what you can do to 
boost everybody like right. happier employees less stressed employees are going to help make more money for the company and then that means you can help support more caregivers it's a win-win across the board so that's oh, that's where i'm at most definitely i agree um so can um any i do have i do have listeners in new york so i will make sure that um your guys's website is linked in the show notes Wonderful. so that the new york listeners can <laughs> tap into the services you guys have and for the other 49 states who need to catch up you might be able to check it out and and then start asking around if those services are available here wherever you are and then advocating to bring those services to wherever you are because technically i'm in a rural area which an hour from the state capital is a little hard to believe that they classify it that <laughs> um you know i don't think most of california is rural but whatever. <laughs> That's just my bias. Yep. Um, you know, but I know I can't go anywhere without ending up in a conversation about caregiving or Alzheimer's or All dementia, or it's like, man, am I the bummer at the party or what? <laughs> no, I swear I'm, I'm being stopped for it. But if you are in New York, so if there are listeners in New York, every inch of New York state is covered under the Alzheimer's disease caregiver support initiative. There are 10 contractors across New York state, just like me, who run these type of programs. All you need to do is reach out to your office of the aging and they will point you in that direction. Every inch of New York state is covered. So other okay. states, they need to get on board. Yes, so we I do. My husband is from Staten Island. So mm -hmm. he likes to tell everybody, I was born and raised in New York city. It's like, <laughs> mm, well you came here when you were 12 so i don't yeah. know about that part um but yes um everybody should check that out advocate mm -hmm. for what you need check in with your local office of aging yes um or they sometimes they call them area offices of aging mm -hmm. and they can point you in the right direction they're probably understaffed and overwhelmed too but just be patient and work with them and yes we can make this happen we can help yeah. caregivers take care of themselves so we can keep this country chugging along <laughs> It's true. There's a, it's a great cause. And, and if you aren't a caregiver, you, you, the likelihood is high that you will be at some point. So why not get some services going? Yep. And you, it might just be your neighbors and you know, if you like your neighbors, help them out. That's right. Support squad. Yep. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I appreciate that Valerie reached out to me and her, her team reached out to me. And this is such an important topic. I think we could talk about it every month. All the time. Well, well thank, thank you, you very much. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.